Hi, today we take a look at the work in chapter 6 which is plant nutrition. So before we get started I thought I would introduce you to a friend of mine, dun, 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 Groot. He's going to help us with today's lesson. Now what's amazing about Groot is that he can produce his own food and that means that he's an autotroph. An autotroph means that he can produce complex organic compounds from simple compounds in his surroundings such as carbon dioxide, water and minerals which are found in the soil. From these simple substances he produces these complex organic compounds. Now what are your complex organic compounds? They are your lipids, your proteins and your carbohydrates. He basically produces all those himself as well as vitamins which is another organic substance. So how does Groot do this? Well, he does this by photosynthesis. Let me explain. Photosynthesis is the process by which plants produce their own carbohydrates using the sun's energy. So how does a plant capture the sun's energy? Well, it's got these specialized organelles in its cells called chlorophyll. And chlorophyll is the green pigment that you see in green plants. Chlorophyll captures the sun energy it absorbs it and then it releases this energy to combine the water and carbon dioxide and this makes glucose. With this glucose, oxygen is also released and that is how plants produce oxygen which we breathe in. This is how it works. Photosynthesis results in the conversion of light energy to chemical energy. Sunlight travels uh, into our plant leaves and it gets absorbed by the chlorophyll organelles inside the cells of the leaf. Now this energy when it's absorbed is used to join carbon dioxide and water to form our glucose molecules and this is how light energy gets converted to chemical energy. There's actually an equation that shows how carbon dioxide and water gets converted to glucose and oxygen. So let's talk about leaves. I see Groot here has grown us one. So photosynthesis happens inside the chloroplast, inside the cells of the leaf. Now it's important to note that the leaf is covered by epidermal cells. It's got a layer of epidermal cells on the top and a layer of epidermal cells at the bottom. These epidermal cells do not contain chloroplasts and they are actually um, transparent to allow light into the leaf. So you can think of this leaf as a glucose producing factory. Now if we could zoom into the cell, what would we see? Well, let's zoom. So this is what the microscopic structure of a leaf would look like. Um, we've got our upper epidermal layer and our upper epidermal layer secretes um, the wax-like substance which forms the cuticle which protects the leaf. Um, in the middle we've got our mesophile layer and you'll notice that I wrote palisade and spongy here. And this is the top half is our palisade mesophile. Here we have dense oval shaped cells and they're high in chloroplasts. Um, at the bottom we've got our spongy mesophile and these cells are more round and they also got more air spaces in between which allows air to diffuse in between the cells and so that they can also reach the palisade mesophile layer. At the bottom we've got our lower epidermis here we have our stomata which allows the diffusion of carbon dioxide into the cell and oxygen can also escape uh, via the stomata. Now leaves have special adaptations to help them with this process of photosynthesis. First of all the leaf has, is quite broad and it's held in the air which exposes it to all the carbon dioxide around the leaf. Leaves are specially adapted. They have a broad flat part called the lamina and there's a stalk holding the leaf to the rest of the plant and in the stalk we've got vascular bundles which comprise of your xylem and your phloem and this is how the plant transports water and sugars around. Then we've also got tiny structures inside the leaf. Uh, these are called your leaf veins. Carbon dioxide can enter 
via the stomata go into the air spaces inside the leaf. The carbon dioxide can then go to the mesophyll cells inside the leaf and then diffuse across the cell wall and the plasma membrane and into the cell and then further into the chloroplast. Now Groot gets his water from the soil. Water enters through the root hairs and it gets drawn up into the xylem vessels, up into the leaves of the plant. It then goes to the mesophylls via osmosis. Leaves are also adapted to absorb as much sunlight as possible. As I said before, the epidermal cells of the leaf do not contain chloroplasts and they transparent which allows sunlight to go straight through them into the mesophyll cells which do have chloroplasts and there the sunlight gets absorbed. So now that Groot has made all this glucose, what is he going to do with it? Well glucose is his energy source as well as ours. The only difference is he made his glucose himself. We get our glucose from food which we eat. So he can either use his glucose as energy straight away or he can store his glucose and how he stores that is he stores it as starch which he does by joining a whole bunch of glucose molecules together. Now the importance of this is starch is much more stable than glucose. Glucose is very reactive. Now starch is a large molecule inside the plant and starch molecules can form granules and this is an excellent way of storing glucose. Now Groot can also use glucose to make proteins and why, how he can do that is he gets nitrogen from the soil and he joins these nitrogen ions with glucose to form amino acids and when he joins all the amino acids together they form proteins. Glucose is also used to make sucrose, cellulose, fats and oils and his own chlorophylls. Now why he would make sucrose which is also a sugar it needs to transport the energy captured which he converted to chemical energy glucose to other parts around the plant but glucose is too reactive so he changes the glucose to sucrose which is also a small molecule but it's much more stable it's not reactive and this way he transports his sucrose around his energy around his, his body and then he can change the sucrose back to glucose when it is in another part of the plant where it needs the glucose energy. Alright, so how do we test for starch? Well, iodine. Add a drop of iodine to starch and it will turn a blue black color. Read the experiment in your textbook, it will explain it wonderfully. Now there are some factors that limit the rate of photosynthesis. One of them is sunlight. So when we have sunlight shining down on Groot's leaves, he absorbs that sun energy. Now the more intense the sun, like on a sunny day, there will be a lot more sun rays hitting his leaves and that, therefore a lot more energy than on say a very overcast day or at night when there's no sun energy. So the higher the sun energy, the higher the intensity of the sun on Groot, the more energy absorbs and the higher the rate of photosynthesis. However, there is a maximum rate of photosynthesis that can occur in the leaves of Groot. And when that maximum is reached, no matter if you increase the intensity of the light energy, the photosynthesis reaction will not increase its rate. So increasing light energy increases rate of photosynthesis, decreasing light energy decreases rate of photosynthesis. The same goes for carbon dioxide. Increasing the carbon dioxide concentration around Groot increases the rate that he absorbs this carbon dioxide and this increases the rate of photosynthesis. Conversely, decreasing carbon dioxide decreases the rate of photosynthesis. Another limiting factor is the temperature. Now remember there are enzymes involved in photosynthesis. So these enzymes work better at higher temperatures. So if it's a warm day, Groot will photosynthesize a lot faster than on a cold wintry day. Now you must remember that enzymes can be denatured at certain temperatures such as like high temperatures for example like 60 degrees Celsius. The last limiting factor that Groot has is his stomata. Now the stomata opens and closes to allow carbon dioxide in. So stomata will open on warm days. However, when it gets very very hot and it's very dry Groot will close his stomata because 
These are holes inside a cell and water can also escape through the stomata by diffusion. Thus, if it's really, really hot, roots will close the stomata, decreasing the rate of photosynthesis. But this actually is a survival mechanism because it helps him save his water. So why is photosynthesis so important? Well, through this process of photosynthesis, carbon dioxide and water get joined to make glucose and oxygen and oxygen is released by the plants for us to breathe and this is what maintains life on earth all right let's go take a look at some past papers if we take a look at question 12 the bar chart shows the average number of chloroplasts in each of three different types of leaf cell so basically the question asks us here what are the three types of cells so basically what we need to figure out is which type of cell has the highest amount of chloroplasts and which has the least amount of chloroplasts. Here we've, we are given some options, but before we take a look at this, I quickly want to take a look at this diagram here found in your textbook. Here we can see that the cells of the palisade mesophyll have the most chloroplasts. We can visually see them as these green uh, circles. And here in the spongy mesophile, we can see these cells have less chloroplasts. Lastly, the guard cells have the least amount of chloroplasts. Alright, now we can go back and look at our options. So the least amount of chloroplasts would be our guard cells. So we need to look for number one that corresponds to guard cells. And here we can see that's option A. And since there's no other options, we can basically rule out the rest. But just to make sure, just to double check, let's quickly take a look. So two has the highest amount and we saw that would be our palisade mesophile layer has the highest amount of chloroplast so then we see okay we've checked that that is correct palisade mesophile has the highest amount it correlates two and two and lastly number three has the intermediate amount of chloroplast and we can see that we can just check that here again so our answer here would be a okay so let's take here a look at a long question 6a1 asks state the word equation for photosynthesis now we know photosynthesis is a conversion of it combines carbon dioxide with water and that equals glucose and oxygen all right 62 asks a plant needs chlorophyll to photosynthesize name the part of a plant that contains chlorophyll now this question can get a little bit tricky and it's easy to get off track here um, but what the question is asking is where is chlorophyll which is the green pigment found and if you remember chlorophyll is the green pigment inside your chloroplast organelles which is, are inside the cells which are inside the leaf but the answer they are looking for here is chloroplasts because that's the part of a plant cell that is the key it's a part of a plant cell that contains chlorophyll not which part of the plant or which kind of cell it's which part of a plant cell contains chlorophyll so our answer is chloroplasts section 3 asks us to state two types of specialized cells that contain chlorophyll well if you remember from your diagram we know the three kinds there's three kinds it's the palisade mesophile cells the spongy mesophile cells and the guard cells so you can choose any three of those cells as your options. Section B asks us to, in an investigation, some students placed a plant in a bright light. They measured the rate of photosynthesis at different temperatures. The results are shown in figure 6.1. So here we have our figure. We've got rate of photosynthesis versus temperature. So the first question asks us to describe the results shown in figure 6.1. Well, we can see there's an upward trend um, on this graph and as temperature increases, the rate of photosynthesis increases as well. So that would be our description. Section 2 here asks us to suggest an explanation for these results. Well, just off the, the top of my head, um, chemical reactions occur faster at higher temperature because that the molecules are moving around faster and there's more chance of the molecules bumping into each other. Another explanation could, is also that enzymes work 
better at higher temperatures. And then section 3 asks us to predict the effects on the rate of photosynthesis if the investigation is carried out at 60 degrees Celsius. Well, then they ask us to explain our answer. So, my prediction would be that the rate of photosynthesis would actually decrease at 60 degrees Celsius because even though the temperature is higher than what is shown here we won't see a continual upward trend there will become a point where the temperature gets so high that the rate of photosynthesis will have reached its maximum another reason is also that the enzymes get denatured at such high temperatures so i hope this video helped you guys a lot good luck with the studying and go and get those good marks